<coughs> okay, Vermont history students, all three of you. Um, I'm driven up to uh, the one room in the house where it's not overwhelmingly noisy because of the construction. Welcome to uh, my bedroom. And uh, we are now at Unit 9, and I'll keep this simple. This is a great class when I do it in person because it's all about George Aiken. And um, if you study Vermont, live in Vermont, know about Vermont, you will run across the name George Aiken all the time. He's like the greatest Vermont hero. He's like the icon of Vermont. And if I taught this class in person, I would use lots of primary documents, lots of images, and tell the story in a really elaborate, long-term way about why, when Aiken was governor in the late 1930s, um, it basically set the stage for Vermont to gracefully transition from what it was to what it became, and that Aiken is this enormous agent of change and transition that allowed Vermont to gracefully evolve um, so that it modernized in a way that reinforced and um, elaborated, made more elaborate Vermont tradition. Uh, he's cool that way, and you do need to appreciate about, um, first of all, of course, it is within the context of the Great Depression, and where the last class finished off, the part about eugenics, and then the flood of 27, um, the Great Depression, of course, follows right immediately after that, which presents Vermont with this enormous host of changes. The Great Depression, in a lot of ways, is um, like the stake in the heart of a lot of what the old Vermont used to be. Um, but there's also long-term changes going on. Uh, the number of dairy farms in Vermont uh, peaked in about the 1880 census at about 35,000. Um, now, in 2013, we're down to like 600. Um, so that's an enormous decline since World War II. But the number of dairy farms was already in decline um, prior to World War II. In the 1920s and 30s, far, uh, the number of farms was declining. Uh, in addition, the foundation of Vermont's economy was extractive industries, marble, granite, lumber, uh, paper making, textiles, and all these different aspects of the old Vermont economy were already in steep decline, um, in decline before the Great Depression and then the Great Depression damaged them even further to a great extent. Uh, so there's the context of that. Um, there's the context of Vermont having this, Vermonters having this great faith and um, pride in paying, doing it themselves and being self-sufficient and paying as they go. Uh, but big problems require big solutions and the flood of 27 is the first great example of this. Vermont received $2,500,000 of federal assistance so they could do things like rebuild the bridge that runs between Winooski and Burlington uh, at the uh, end of, uh, of Pearl Street. Um, and uh, the, uh, you know, state um, just was coming around to the point where, like, the old way of doing things just uh, didn't work very well anymore. Uh, to finish off the first part of the unit, the first section, a good example of how Vermont was um, needed to confront the reality of the fact that it was not this idyllic, backwater, rural, resplendent, pastoral ideal, but in fact had many of the same challenges and problems as other states around the nation, is the really bitter marble strike of 1935-36. Uh, I've done research on it, so I have this enormous trove of primary documents, letters, and um, newspaper articles and things, which obviously don't translate very well to an online class, which I would show you in class, but take my word for it. The marble industry was the one of the chief industries of Vermont. The Vermont Marble Company, which was owned by the Proctors, was a um, foundation of the Vermont economy. And not only that, the Vermont Marble Company made the Proctors a very powerful family in Vermont politically for more than half a century. And in 1935, they announced that they were going to um, cut wages. And first in the town of Danby, where there was a big Vermont marble mine, marble mine, and then um, Quarry. And then in the other towns, um, Rutland in particular, workers went out on strike in the fall of 1935. And it just turned into this horrible, nasty strike with workers getting kicked out of their houses and living in tent villages and violence and pickets. 
Um, there was the dynamiting of um, power lines and dynamiting of railroad tracks and dynamiting of bridges. The union said that it was the company doing sabotage in order to make them look bad. The company said, of course, that the workers were doing this. Um, they brought the company brought in French Canadian strike breakers, and then there was violence against the strike breakers. Just horrible. Which, for a lot of the sort of like summer people who were New York intellectuals, was a big shock to them that New that Vermont would be experiencing just the same kind of miserable, horrible strike that people experience elsewhere in the uh, years 1934 through 1936 or so, 37. I mean, this is a time of nationwide labor disruption. Vermont had it too. And it's really that sort of that point where Vermont needs to adjust to and accommodate itself to modern conditions and modern challenges. And the question is, can Vermont do it in a way that it doesn't lose tradition? And that's where George Aiken comes in. Aiken was a, um, extraordinarily, he was totally the mid-hill ideal. He was a dairy farmer from a dairy farm, but he was very interested in wildflowers. Uh, and he opened up a nursery and sold wildflower seeds. So he's both a farmer and a businessman. He um, got a late start in politics. It wasn't until his mid-30s that he got elected to the state legislature in 1930. But his ascendancy is enormously quick. He already had, from various farmers groups, he had connections all over the state. He goes from being a first-term legislator to Speaker of the House, and then Lieutenant Governor in 34, and then in 36 got himself elected Governor. And, you know, usually the people who are governors in Vermont are people like, who own railroads or marble companies. Aiken owned a small mail order seed business, but the Great Depression sort of like shakes the foundation of the power structure in Vermont as elsewhere, and the result was that it was the perfect time for Aiken to rise up the way he did. And he is a extraordinary governor from the beginning. He immediately began speaking to labor banquets and labor groups, unions, were never something that Vermont governors ever addressed. But Aiken did. And then his message to them was extraordinary. It was, Vermont's government is your government, you're Vermonters just like everyone else. Whoever called you know, Italians and Irish you know, marble quarry workers Vermonters before. It didn't happen. And they did, could say it themselves, of course, and the imagined community of Vermonters is an ongoing discussion and debate. The word Vermonter, the designation, is really, a, as you hopefully know from this course by now, is a question about what was Vermont in the past, what should it be now, what should it be in the future, who gets to participate in the process by which Vermont becomes something else. Um, and Aiken said to workers, you, and particularly Catholics, you are Vermonters too. Aiken, of course, was very popular with the farming class, being a farmer, and he then tr built bridges between workers and farmers that had never existed before. He built a coalition, as the um, outline says, of particularly organized around Arthur Packard, who was the head of the Farm Bureau, and John Lawson, who was head of the Granite Cutters Union, brought them together, and they formed a nice cooperative relationship. In addition, he um, would settle strikes in his office. Um, instead of nasty strikes like the marble strike, he would call management and labor representatives into his governor's office and say, we're calling out for sandwiches and we're not going to leave here until we resolve this dispute. And then when they would come out with a resolution, he would say, and see, we solved the strike with no government interference at all, which is unlike the marble strike, which cost $50,000, and um, decisively the governor at the time was on the side of uh, management. And so Aiken is this agent of change in which he builds bridges between different kinds of people who had very little in common before. Now, there are many people in the old Republican hierarchy establishment who hated Aiken's guts. Um, and they, you know, this sort of liberal Republicanism was everything that they were opposed to. And what you see in the late 1930s is Aiken is sort of splintering the Republican Party into two halves. The old guard, more conservative wing, and then the Aiken-Gibson, what becomes the Aiken-Gibson wing, which is the sort of more liberal wing. And that, sort of, and that sets the stage for Vermont eventually becoming a two-party state. The Aiken-Gibson wing, in many ways, will become eventually people who vote for the Democrats. But for a while, 
workers in Vermont voted for Aiken. They registered as Repub Republicans and voted for Aiken because Aiken stood up for them. But always he described it in the context of Vermont tradition, that Vermont was a place of traditional cooperation and that unions are just like dairy cooperatives. They're ways that people join together to get things done. And so in that way, of course, he not only provided a way for Vermont to move forward and modernize, but he did it in a way that actually cultivated Vermont tradition and made it more relevant to the present than ever. So that by the end of his governorship, which is 1941, into the post-war years, you have things like the Farmer Labor Council and the Vermont Industrial Relations Council and all these cooperative organizations that really um, designated Vermont, denoted it as being a sort of, uh, you know, very progressive state, which is something that Vermont had never had the reputation of being before. So just appreciate George David Aiken was the man and that he figured out a way to drag Vermont into the future in a way that made tradition more relevant than ever, which is an incredible trick. But my question for you that you have to sort of figure out, and at this point in the semester, we need to make some long-term conclusions based on what you've seen over the course of the whole rest of the semester. The question that Aiken's governorship brings up is, so what gives the imagined community of Vermonters its strength? What gives the term Vermonter, the designation Vermonter, such meaning? Is it strong because it's defined narrowly and rigidly that it's hard to become a Vermonter? and that people argue vehemently about what it is to be a Vermonter and have very narrow definitions? Or does the term Vermonter historically and in the 30s gain its strength when it is defined really broadly and lots and lots of people are defined as being Vermonters? Is it strong because it's rigid and narrow or strong because it's broad and flexible? And that's what I'm interested in you telling me about, okay?